Bergman 1910. Scrody, nasty, dirty. Look at I mean, look at all this gack all over this stuff. It's like wax. You ever wonder what WD-40 looks like 40 years on? Well, here it is, all over the top of this. Look at the machining that got done in this thing. Well, really the reason why I want to show this to you today is just to show you how it works and you know why there are a lot of different ways to skin the cat, but basically it's all the same cat. Down the rabbit hole, let's go. I'm gonna tell you something. People that consistently attempt to use WD-40 as a lubricant, you see this wad of GAC here? Okay, that is what dried on WD-40 looks like. You may think that this is um, Cosmoline, but it's really not. Someone had been in here before and had tried to scrape all this shit off the inside of this thing. And I know that we're kind of family friendly and I shouldn't have sworn, but uh, can you think of a more appropriate word? I don't know. I could call it Glock, but then the guys in Austria get, get ticked off. Who cares? What we're doing in, in a conservation here is we're just trying to remove all this stuff and not take any of the finish off. So we're going to boil this in dihydrogen monoxide. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But while we got this up here, look at the machining on this thing. I mean... Somebody came in the tool path around. There's a dipsy doodle. This was not done freehand. There is a mill. You have a milling machine, and this milling machine is set up to run one evolution. You may have a milling machine that does nothing but cut this down square or rectangular. Then you have another milling machine that makes this cut. So then you got a box of these parts moving down the line. And every single one of those machines is doing one thing. One guy doesn't sit down and bang this whole side plate out. Because he makes one mistake. Mm -mm. You don't depend upon the human to etch a sketch the handles the right way. You look at this frame. There we go. I think we're going to pull back a little bit. Yeah. This frame was made by multiple machining cuts. Look at that. You got one right there. This is, um, was plunged in, cut out, rounded off. This was probably broached. Let me get the lights up in here. That was probably broached. Wait a minute, let me get the light down behind it. That would make it look even better. We'll do this. There we go. I mean, how the hell do you make that hole and make it that thin and have this entire thing be made out of a solid block of steel? There is not a seam in this anywhere prohibitive in today's world you could never ever spend this much time you really couldn't i mean look at that you cut this how did they cut that was that made and then slid in i haven't found a seam on it anywhere one of bruno's lifelong deals is to build a time machine so that he can go back about 150 years and go fly on a wall in one of these factories and just look at what it took to put this stuff together well, what we're doing here today, I'm told that this gun was in a fire, a separate fire from all the other stuff we've been doing, but there's all these shankers on it. They're, um, I don't know, and they're, they're flat and they're gray. And I would have to tell you that there is a, a, um, a firefighting chemical called mono sodium, mono ammonium phosphate. That's all folks. Monoammonium phosphate, and monoammonium phosphate is made with phosphoric acid. And I got to tell you what, phosphoric acid is what you parkerize a gun with. So I've tried to blue these guns to catch them back up, and they will not catch back up. They won't do it. It'll come out. It'll be white as a drawbird in in um, uh, another month. This gun will still be white. So it doesn't matter. We're going to have to bead blast this thing, and we're going to. But what about its collector value? I got news for you, man. The collector value disappeared off this weapon a long time ago. Look at that. You see that? These, these craters here, it's almost like it's been parkerized. It's really odd. So, just like we did with the Steyr Han, we're not going to attempt to polish. 
or knock any of this off. What we're going to do is put sort of a mate finish on this thing and try to keep what's good, knock back what's bad, and then put a very, very light rust blue on it to make it look less heinous. Again, we're not the ones that made the decision to do this to this. Again, we've shown this before where this is just some $35 Wally World um, deep fat fryer that we have pressed into service as a, uh, a water boiler. We have, uh, it just has heating element in it. We just wound it all the way out so it'll go. It's coming up to a boil now. And there's enough water in here to run for about 45 minutes before the water level's getting down to the point where it starts uncovering things in the basket. So we're just gonna let this rock for about 45 minutes and that will do a pretty good job of knocking all that gack loose. Brownells part number 3601646631 four row wood center brush made by Grobay USA 16.463 is the part number 3000 wires one each y'all gonna ask so I thought I'd just cut to the chase okay we've boiled and now we are carding. This is not a wire wheel. This is a 3000s wheel. I've shown this before. We have entire videos of this. But we're just taking off. When you boil all the oil off of something, you're left with just the rust and its aftermath. And since we've converted that to an oxide now, it just comes right off. And then the stuff that was just flat out dirt just comes off with it. For getting up inside the nooks and crannies, the toothbrush works really well. This is just essentially powered steel wool. Um, we've got entire videos on doing this, but the point I want to make is, is that even when we converted this, the blue stuff stayed blue, but the surface finish on this thing is pretty much wrecked, and it was wrecked by somebody other than us. This Smith & Wesson has been rust blued four times and it still has all these white spots on it because it too was in a fire and those white spots are not gonna blue because they're parkerized. Eventually, this is a personal revolver of mine, but eventually this gun will be torn all the way down, bead blasted and blued again. Um, and that's the same thing that we're about to do to this Bergman, same deal, same shanker, same spots and it may not be coming across on video very well but we are going to have to bead blast this so let's go do that we're not sand blasting this we're bead glass beating it all we're doing is knocking the stuff off down in those craters we're not really changing the surface contours at all And all the pits are still there, and all the grossness is still there. We have just removed all the faint hate and discontent. You want to blast this with the side plate on because you don't want to be able to see that line. We'll blast it, we'll blue it, and we'll card it with the side plate on, and then we'll pop it off. You won't have a white line there. All right, that's about it. That's all I wanted to do. And I'll just do the rest of them and we'll get back over and talk about hanging this thing uh, out to blue. That bead blaster, the medium that I use today, has been used at least five or six times. The vacuum cleaner that you heard running was collecting all of the chips, all the sawdust, if you will. And then we take all that and pour it back inside the sandblaster. And that's when I refer to ground up marshmallow farts. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, so like I said, this is a hot water Belgian blue. But uh, they don't have any right now, and it's not their fault. And I'm right back to it. Now what I'm hoping the supply houses do is keep track of what the professionals have been asking for. And when it's available again, they get a hold of us 
first. They won't, but that would be common courtesy because a lot of us are going to go to zero here. Now, when we carve, come back and recard, a lot of this surface um, finish is still going to be here. What those beads did was those beads took that very, very, very thin layer of black oxide off the top that was still remaining um, and did not take a whole lot of the surface polish with it. And that's one of the beauties of beading. Now, there are times when these things are so far gone, you have to sandblast them. But I prefer to not use anything that coarse unless I'm going to paint the gun. Because when you sandblast something, you lose your surface polish. Whereas when you bead blast it, and you'll notice I wasn't exactly beading on this thing very hard. I just hit it till the color changed and got off it. You can do a pretty serviceable thing. And for those of you that are wondering, go back and watch the one on the Steyr Han. And uh, we did a... Uh, we did an actual rust blue on that gun. There's some areas I was so light on the bead blast that it's not even attacking it because the, uh, the original finish is already there. Now this is uh, just like a rust blue in that the finish is in the steel, not on it. A hot dip blue, the finish is on the surface. And a hot dip blue can be pulled off um, fairly easily and not... Um, actually remove any metal this stuff to get this color off when we're done it will have to be <clears throat> sandblasted or um, it'll have to be pulled off chemically you have to dip it in acid again this is not a coat we're not putting on a coat we are applying chemical at this time we're applying a chemical and we'll let this sit here and attack for another five or six minutes or so remember this is diluted so it's not going to come out perfectly blue the first time it's going to be almost like a, a mate black and then we'll go one more time and this thing will come down dark blue and if you get a foot away from it you're not going to really know how screwed up it was i've been asked how to card down inside of things toothbrushes work good a question i get asked a lot and it's not a dumb question, but it, it, you know, it almost sounds like I'm saying, duh, when I answer it is, how do I card the inside of the gun barrel? Well, a bore brush works real good. Anyway, and I'm not trying to do that. So we only went one, one application. We didn't do two applications on this because we're, we're not trying to, this is not a new gun. You can still see all the pitting. And again, it's kind of like when we did Bruno's, um, um, when we did his Han, all we are attempting to do is sort of just um, fare this out, feather this out. It's presentable. It doesn't have all the, the, the finish variations. It doesn't have um, uh, all the obvious pitting, but the pits are still there. But if you get this far away from it, 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 it looks good. I'm gonna finish oil in this thing, um, all the pieces, and then we'll do a, um, a lay down here. Again, the oil that we're using is a little bit of just straight zero detergent 30 weight lawnmower oil. You can get it down at any hardware store because it doesn't have anything that wants to remove rust. And after all, bluing is just a form of converted rust. Therefore, we want to make sure that um, we don't remove that. Now, after you do the initial oiling and after you get done scrubbing everything down, you can go back to using gun oil once you harden it off. But I just use it. It's, it's cheap. It's cheesy. It's just Briggs & Stratton lawnmower oil or whatever the heck makes your lawnmower oil um let's see here yeah and you get up inside all the little nooks and crannies and we'll blow it down with air except my air hose doesn't reach all the way over here so it it, it won't do that all right anyway i'm gonna keep going with the rest of this stuff we'll lay it down we'll do a parts description and uh put this thing back together again kind of got this separated into functional groups and again this is another one of these guns that 
I've never put it together because I've never actually had the opportunity to take one of these apart. So, because this one came in in a, in, a, in, in a parts bag. That's the safety right there. That's the safety spring and plunger that's going to mount on the other side of the frame. I'm looking at this and I'm thinking that the first thing that's got to happen is, is that this disconnector gizmo has got to get put up in here. This is the piece, and I also noticed something else. The correct way to go, they've all got numbers on them. See that 425? This piece has a 425. Everything is numbered, and the numbers have to face you, and that's how you know when you're putting it in the right way that the numbers are facing you. So that dropped in there, and then there's this little itty-bitty plunger screw. Good Lord, there's no way to even show you guys me putting that in there. That's going to drop in. We're going to grab the smallest tweaker we got and run down on this. And eventually it should intercept. No, we're up a little bit too much. we got to find that. So we're just probing for it. Where'd you go, you little bugger? Huh, there it is. See, it dropped in. Now we go. So, you know, you're always feeling for the bottom of these holes and uh, you just have to kind of be careful with that and then we can see here the interrelationship that this is not allowed to drop when the safety is rotated so that'll get pushed up and i just want to put this in and get it out of the way i just want to have that out of the way so we can see here we can see through where that disconnector is bouncing up and down right there so we'll want to lift that up and by the way if you guys want to see a fabulous animation of this go to um primer number 140 on c and arsenal they just dropped it a little while ago and in that episode bruno did a fabulous take on this i'm going to pop this up in a vice for a second hang on all right i've come up here on the universal work holding system and i've grabbed this thing so that i can use both of my hands put a little bit of oil in here when we assemble this this is the um this is that lucas stuff again i'm not getting paid to talk about it it just works really 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 freaking well all right now since we have bead blasted this thing we want to make sure that we can exercise this and it's not gritting right and then it runs all the way up to the inside of the tunnel there and it appears to be doing that and i would think that this would have ah there you go that's all the way in see so we got to make sure it does that it doesn't grit it doesn't bump because when we introduce this plunger in here and there's the slot that cuts off the uh cuts off the the disconnector right there that's the slot we'll roll this back around and just get this out of the way now the way it works is it's going to engage in these two detents right here bang and bang so it's either going to be down or it's going to be up so i'm guessing we might get lucky and just be able to shove this thing out of the way oh wait a minute wait a minute I needed to move the disconnector out of the way. That needs to be gone. Okay, there we go. I'm going to make sure here that I'm not screwing myself. And does this have to go in a certain way? It should just drop straight through the hole. Bruno indicates yes. So what I was saying in the other take was, is they did a magnificent animation of this. And it's in primer number 140 on, over on C and Arsenal. And they did the history of this weapon, which is incredible um and why it took so long to make it and why it everything just kind of seemed to go not anybody's way all right so right now i don't know whether or not i've got this plunger in the right spot and it looks like i do so i should be able to just roll up on this bang so when i rolled up on it and it popped in you can see that this acts as a detent safety's up slides locked and then it locks out everything on the inside. And we'll deal with that when we get around the other side. But there we go. So I've reset on the vise here just because i got a couple of things I want to get out of the way first. That spring has a very low D to D ratio. That wire is awful thick for how big around this spring is. Which tells me that this magazine catch is going to fight me a little bit. Okay, so I've got that spring inside that tunnel. And if you don't want that spring to fall out. Here's what you might call a pro tip. Just take a little dollop of lithium grease and you fill this hole up. Hang on a minute. Right there, you fill that hole up full of this lithium grease, which isn't gonna hurt, it'll lubricate stuff. And then you take the spring and you set it down in here. Like 
like that. And what that grease will do is allow you to turn that over and it'll hang on to this thing and it doesn't get in your way when you're all done. That'll slide up in there. A lot of gunsmithing is just figuring out how to hang on to stuff so that you don't damage the parts, right? So you come up underneath and you shove this pin in from the bottom so that it'll hang on to it. Hang on a minute, I'm doing this by braille here. There we go. Not a good thing to be doing on a low dexterity day. So there's the mag release, now it's in. We got the pin hanging onto it. And then I've ground a very, very slight bevel on the end of this, just a very slight bevel, so that it will want to go into the hole. You get it in there and it will start tapping on it now with the light hammer. Now what the bottom presentation lets you do is, if you look at the mag release, you see it moving? I can manipulate this punch to steer the part so that the pin will go through the right way. And then we just chase the pin out. We, we chase out the assembly stud right there. Okay. Right. There's our mag catch. Now it's out of the way. That's four parts that are not on the bench anymore. And guess what? That spring is beautifully lubricated. A little bit of lithium grease never hurt anybody. So then we'll fly in here with the hammer. And we'll see that when the, the, uh, the hammer is back, when you put the safety on, the safety actually mechanically blocks this hammer from coming forward. I like this. And all I've got to make sure is, is that when this is forward, when you come off safe, that the sear still intercepts it. We'll check that. The part that we put in before, that we put in first, is this guy right here. And this will come into its own being as a reset. Wow, look at that. How annoying is that? Look at this. I'm moving that part sideways with this magnetized punch. Gah! The humming you're hearing is my part being demagnetized. And we'll throw the sear in. So again, we can see the part number. We'll take this uh, tweaker here and we'll move that spring here, hang on a minute. Oh, yep, it's actually working. Yep, and that sits down. And that spring, that's the sear spring. But again, like I said the last time with the Kennedy, this had better hold tension with this spring out of the way. I don't want to take this out. We didn't have to take it out, but, you know, we also didn't have a problem with the hammer dropping. But that geometry should be in such a way that as you push back on this, the hammer should come back slightly. And if you look, it actually is. And what that's proving is that that angle is slightly greater than 90 degrees. And the mainspring is actually holding this thing cocked, which is good to know. All right, so that's in. And then I guess what's left down here is the trigger. And the trigger, again, has been lubricated. You can see that. I think I'm a little out of focus, but don't worry about it. There we go. That spring is in there, and we put a little bit of oil down in that, and we just make sure that this isn't crunching. Okay. And that will drop in that hole right there. And that goes down underneath that. Now, again, I'm telling you, Bruno did a fabulous animation on this. We'll put the link over to um, get over to a, a primer number 140, where they did all the history on this thing. And the engineering in this thing is amazing because they did a lot on relatively low parts count but it's amazing how simple it gets when you don't have a magazine coming right up through the center of it all right so i punted and made a tool and i know there are a lot of these memes out there about you know i own a dremel so i'm a gunsmith well no dremel tools actually have a, a place i just went ahead and i cut a groove down in this screwdriver blade so that I could get in behind this thing and lean up on the handle and shove this spring in it and have some control over it. Bruno had noted that when he did one earlier, he took the hammer and shoved the whole hammer in, but I don't like lo side loading any pins that are sticking. It, it just, it's a matter of what you got. I'm in a vice, he didn't, he used what he had and I'm using what I have. So I'm coming about halfway down there because as this pivots in, 
you, if, if you go all the way down like this, the bottom corner of this thing is sticking out. It swings in a radius. So you're trying to make your life a little bit better. We'll go halfway down, we'll grab this here, and then we've got to rotate it and compress it. So here we go. Now I'm leaning into this and I weigh an eighth of a ton. So I'm putting a, you know, put some ass in it, boy. We know you got some. Get a little bit lower here. There we go. Now that's in and it's sitting there and I'm holding it with my hand and attempting to drive this down and not have it come hauling ass out the back end of this at me. And now I've got to support it with a heavier hammer underneath because I don't want to unjig it. And I'll get up underneath it like this with a big hammer. And you can hear the difference in tone that it makes while I drive it down home. And buddy, we are there. Now, what we don't want to do, we, while you can cock this thing and watch it work, none of these pins are supported. We did an episode a long time ago on me doing my Model 29 where that Smith & Wesson, one of these pins had been rung slam off because it had been operated too many times with the side plate loose. So you don't want to do that. Now at this particular juncture, we could put the side plate back on it um, and still be able to put the top of the gun back together again. So we're, remember how scrody that side plate was? Yeah, looking good. Now, yeah, I didn't blew it right there. Who cares? We got all the scrode off of it. And then when we wheeled it, we had the plate attached to the gun. So we don't have that white line here. We don't have that white line showing. So it doesn't look like it's been molested too bad. This is a great place we can just take the back end of the hammer and just sort of massage it down. Now, another tool we had to make, I made another tool out of a screwdriver, which is this driver for the back side it goes in the holes right there and allows us to take that pin out that will sit in and thread into a boss in the other side but since we've made the correct tool here we can grab these here, wait a minute, let me light that there we go and then that just screws in and whenever you see a screw that's like this that's pretty much the manufacturer slash the guy that issued you this gun's clue that you're not supposed to take that apart which is why on a show show, every damn screw on it set up like that. The French really don't like their guns getting taken apart. Remounting in the universal work holding system, there's something I want to point out right away. Resist the temptation to allow this hammer to fall while it's sitting in here. Oh, wait a minute, I got to make up the, um, the, uh, the disconnector has to be made up here. I think we'll do that and then that will allow me to drop. Don't drop this hammer because all of this energy in this spring has got to go somewhere and it's designed to go into the back end of the firing pin not into the frame this applies to 1911s it applies to ar-15s it applies to anything never let a hammer fire a gun never let that hammer drop all right there's several components to this and i'm not assembling it right now i'm just going to show you that the frame slides ever so slightly so that's the lock position that's the unlock position and then we have a bolt that sits up inside of this and another caveat come in here but the bolt and we're going to show you how to, all this goes together because i'm learning this as we go so this moves inside of this and a lot of you guys will go hey that's just a hammer fire luger and you'd be right but wait a minute that's a c96 and you'd be right it's all the same thing there's nothing new but the one other caveat i wanted to uh, bring up here is we did not take this extractor out that's a hundred and something year old spring right there and the way you would get it out if you had to you would attack by pushing up here while camming backwards and you'd push up until these two little lollipops came over the top there was no grit no scrub no nothing behind this and i didn't see the need to flex a spring that's 120 years old that i didn't want to make all right here we go let's go in now for score here this is the locking block and the locking block actually pivots on this part of the frame here so as you as this comes forward that will come up when that comes up it locks these two pieces together inside that square mortise right there so when it does that little move to the rear it just drops that down 
they figured out how to make this so that it'll only go together one way. They made it, that little, that little knob they put there made it more difficult to attempt to assemble this gun the right way. I'm sure there is some squatty somewhere that cut a divot in the back of that. Yeah, I'm sure there is. All right, so this, we're going to put a little bit of lube on this here before we go any further. Drop a little bit of lube right here on the frame. Um, yeah, I know everybody that goes in hot and sandy conditions tells you to run your guns dry. I think guns should be run so wet. That there's a little puff of moisture that comes out of them every time you shoot them. Okay. So you can see in the rear, the block is down. And then when that comes forward, the block will pivot up. And when that block pivots up, it's going to lock the, uh, the sliding part. The I'm going to call it the bolt, for lack of a better term, up. So we'll drop that down. And we'll bring the hammer back and slide that up in there. And I think I'm doing this right. Bruno did one of these for an animation and he's sitting off camera kind of giving me thumbs up and thumbs down um, whenever, uh, whenever, yeah, you see there's a thumbs up right there, right? So whenever we're, uh, whenever we're doing stuff. Okay, so we're there. Now up inside, we're going to hold on to this spring by what's going on up in here inside this square hole. So there's a lot of stuff going on in there. We got to be in sequence, so we're going to re-grab. Now, spring inside of a spring. This particular spring, the closed end has a, a bushing on it that gives you precise uh, mainspring alignment, so or firing pin alignment. So this is going to push on the front of the bolt, but it's got to push on the frame somewhere. Enter the rear sight gizmo. Hey, wait a minute. That looks like a C96 slash Luger. Yeah, buddy. We're all here. It's all the same damn thing. Anyway, this spring, get a little bit of oil. Okay, just a little bit. Essence of oil. And that's going to go inside all of this. Up inside and get pushed all the way forward. Now, how in the heck are we going to get this behind that spring? And it's been kinked and bent and screwed up. Ah. Built-in assembly tool. If you look at this bad boy, there's a flat spot on it. See that flat spot right there? So if we shove in on this, we shove in on this with the flat spot up, that's going to allow us to drop this down behind it, trap the spring, and drop it. Now, I know my hand's in the way, so let's do this again. We'll shove in on that spring and then set this down on it. And then as we pull it out, we should be able to drop that down on it and put it together. That's the operative idea without driving that through the palm of your hand. And uh, here we go. So we're going to stick this in, and it's all got to be forward and in the lock position for it to work. And then eventually that spring will push back on this, and this little lip right here will, will capture it. So I don't know. I have never done this before, but we get in on the other side of this. Lean that forward. Capture that. Hang on a minute. That's too far forward. Yep, and that should just allow us to stick that through. And then the, the force of that spring is keeping this pushed to the rear. And now we have, right? So we, we don't have the firing pin in it yet. That's coming next. So now when we pull back on this, the first thing that happens is the slide and the bolt go to the rear until this unlocks and then this comes all the way to the rear. Now I gotta tell you, this setup replicates itself later in the 1911 and or other frames where they unitize the bolt and the slide then become one part so here the barrel on a 1911 moves to the rear slightly and then it unlocks and lets it go so we have the same going on here except we have a lot fewer pieces and again john browning was a genius firing pin We've taken a look at the end here to make sure that it's hemispherical and doesn't have any um, any detritus on it that would poke a primer. That's going to be held in that way when we shove this through, right? And now I got to figure out how to push on this and not have it get ejected across the room. So let me get that up in there. And in case you guys can hear a couple of sirens going by, it has not rained in South Carolina in a long, long time. And we're having these little brush fires that are starting to pop up. 
And if we hadn't done the maintenance on the forest out here, we would be in a world of hurt. Okay, I think I got it. Um, hand me that big long one. Yeah, it was too big around. Here we go. I'll shove that in. There we go. And that goes through there. So now, you can see how the whole gun works. This mag is epic. The way they made this thing, they took this. They took that part and folded it over that way, and they took this part and folded it over this way. So you have two layers like that. Put a little bit of brazing spelter up in there and put the whole thing in a brazing hearth. And what they made was basically, after they got done drawing the temper, they made this huge rectangular spring. This thing is awesome. And it's why this piece of metal is probably worth more than that piece of metal. Whenever you're putting a mag spring in, Typically, and the only time I've ever seen this not happen was on a show show, but nothing about a show show magazine makes a hill of beans of sense to anybody. It needs to hold the nose of the cartridge up. So you'd want to put it in in this orientation, I believe, is going to be right. Of course, it'll make a liar out of me. This whole thing is just a machined wonder machine fo this follower weighs more than about three rounds of ammo it's insane and it's all made out of one piece probably 15 machining evolutions to make a mag follower they were still feeling their way out in world war one or the first part of the great war showed everybody why that wasn't necessary okay um there's a little bit of uh um what's what are we looking for there never mind that goes in this way, I believe. That's gonna wind up there with that clip snapping in. Do I have it upside down? No, I have it right. All right, okay, there we go. That's underneath there, that snaps in, this retains it. And what you wind up with is that clip snapping in underneath, this is slid in, these two hold this, and snap, crackle, pop. And boy, I tell you what, there was a dedicated effort to make sure that mag don't fall out. Because you are not just casually ripping and rocking with this. This you almost I don't think you would have enough finger strength to open this up by pushing down on it. I don't know. And even then, while you're fiddling with this, you're fiddling with this by the loud switch. So what the hell keeps somebody from just screwing up and touching off a live round? I don't know. Um, however. Yeah, not looking bad. The grips, however, are another story. The grips we were given are these repop. They're they're basically um, like black, I don't know, resin, and they were a, a mold. So they don't fit really well. The escutcheons don't really fit. But right now, I just want to put this thing together and see what it looks like. We're doing a before and after here to show you what it was we accomplished before, after. Pretty sexy, huh? Now, once I do this, we have live ammo and a firearm on a bench. So let's get to a little more appropriate place in order to put some ammo in this thing and see if this gun works, because we didn't even know if it worked. However, I'm not seeing anything that says it won't, so let's go find out. So we're outside now with something that we've never seen even assembled. I've got two rounds in the mag. Never give an automatic more than two rounds to work with until the disconnector proves. The operating system on this is a little bit wonky. So we're not just going to be able to strip a mag with a live round in it. I'm going to put it on safe. We're going to do a bunch of stuff. Well, that's the good news. It picked it up. It fed. It locked. It went bang, safety on. Because I've got to reach inside the, the uh, grip here to be able to get this mag out. It took the next round and it didn't go off again and everything looked pretty tight inside anyway. We didn't do any trigger work. So I'm just gonna go ahead and press to a couple more rounds. Bearing in mind, of course, that there is a live round in the chamber while I'm doing this. Um, this nine millimeter Largo nine by 23, yeah, I think I'm at my capacity right there. So I think that was what five plus one up the chamber. This is an awful lot of gun for that. Okay. Lock a mag, take
take it off safe. Okay, I anticipated that and jerked it a little bit. It did not eject, and I actually jerked that, and I, I will admit to that. Slide lock back, brass everywhere. Not bad, not bad at all. You guys always wanted to see the complete, the complete gun here. And I've got it upside down because I don't want to point it that way just to show it to you out in broad daylight because I don't have a safe sector of fire back there. Let's get back in and talk about cleaning, maintenance, and a couple other things that have to do with, well, 1970 Spanish 9mm Burdan primed uh, 9x23. Surplus corrosive 9mm Largo. Like I said outside, we've got some scrubbing to do. Yet another oldie but a goodie brought back to some semblance of decency, I do believe. Um, I love working on these old gems and I even like it more when I get to pop a couple of rounds out of them. What an amazing opportunity to work on something that was the 1911's contemporary. Two completely different thought processes. Um, I think ergonomically the 1911 wound up better. Uh, you can't say one thing's better than the other, but as always, it's been a pleasure and just remember guys, do the maintenance. Thank you very much.